I'll just invite them while you talk. Okay. Hi there, everyone. This is Sue Tipton, and welcome to our very first Cook, Drink, and Learn. I'm so excited to have so many people joining us today. I think it's going to be a super fun time. So it looks like we've got uh, 49 people have signed up, but 37 are current right now. So we're um, kind of waiting a little bit for them, but we will go ahead and get started uh, now. So just to give you a little housekeeping, if you've not been on this forum before, this is like a webinar. So um, you um, can actually go down and type into the chat screen, and we do welcome your participation. Um, so please feel free to chat in there. We're going to kind of watch those, and um, when we can, we'll comment on them. If you have some questions you'd like answered, uh, there's a little section down there called Ask a Question. If you click on that, please feel free to ask a question. If we don't get to it right away because of uh, all the chatting and all the talking we're going to be doing, um, we will try to answer them by email after the event. So this event is called Crowdcast and it's being recorded. So if you'd like to see the recording later, you just click on the same link that you clicked on to get here and you'll have a recording of the event. So. In case you don't know, I'm Sue Tipton. I'm the owner and winemaker of Acquiesce Winery. And we're coming to you from our vineyard home. Uh, we live in um, a vineyard property that's surrounded by our white Rhone varietals. We have about 10 and a half acres of these Rhone varietals. Um, it's a beautiful sunny day here today. I think it's gonna be 70 degrees. And when I look out in the vineyard, I see the, the leaves on the grapevines. Um, they're orange and yellow and green. And it's just beautiful out there today. So also on the property, we have, uh, we have, uh, <laughs> we have uh, a hundred year old barn on the property that is also serves as our tasting room. And um, let's see, next. This is such a dream for me. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the two guests that are going to be here today. Um, Susan Manfill is joining us from New Hampshire. Uh, she's in Portsmouth, New Hampshire with her husband. Townie's going to be some, doing some of the cooking in the background. And Susan is an award-winning wine and travel writer and educator and creator of the brilliant website Provence Wine Zine, um, where Tony is also the photographer. And if you've not been on the website, you really need to get on it. Susan has spent years in France walking the vineyards, trying the wines, um, talking to the uh, winemakers, and writing great articles. Um, so you really need to check her out. And that's kind of how we met in a way, and she will talk about that later. But I wanted to tell you how thrilled I am to have Susan here today. And Susan will be acting as our MC. But first I want to talk a little bit about David Scott Allen. So happy that David is here. He's going to be the chef today. So hopefully you're going to be cooking along with David. And David is joining us from his kitchen in Tucson, Arizona. And he's the creative and artistic chef and uh, editor of a beautiful website called Coco and Lavender. And if you haven't been on it before, you really do need to check it out, especially with the holidays coming up. He has some super creative recipes that he's made himself, so they work really well. Rodney and I have made a few um, of his recipes and love them. And he's also a great photographer. So it's just a joy to visit. So sign up for his newsletter and um, I'm going to send it over to Susan Manfield. So Susan, welcome and thank you for emceeing today. Thank you, thank you very much. I feel very privileged to be a part of this trio and I hope I can live up to all that you said, Sue. So I, um, 
I'm very excited to, to tell you that we have, I think, 12 states represented here in our audience and at least one person from France. And I think we might have a Canadian on here, too. So it's very exciting to, um, to, to be a part of this. I had the um, privilege, the honor, the, um, the, the very exciting opportunity to meet Sue in 2016. It was a hot day in August in Lodi, California. And if you know Lodi, you might think, what was she doing in Lodi in, in August? Because it's pretty hot there. But I'm sure glad I was there because it was one of the best weekends that I had. And certainly one of the highlights was meeting Sue and Rodney at, at Acquiesce Winery. Sue makes, um, Rome style wines, which essentially means that she uses the grapes that are indigenous to or most associated with the Rhone Valley in, in France. And I write, as she said, the Provence wine zine, and I cover Provence, but I also cover Southern Rhone and to some extent uh, Northern Rhone. So I, when I tasted her wines, I said to myself, ooh, how can I start writing about her wines? And I managed to, to make that connection because these are Rome style wines. And uh, I'm, I'm sure glad that I was able to do that. Sue makes uh, outstanding wines. She makes 10 wines in total, eight of which, you, Sue, you can correct me if I've misremembered this, but eight of which are white wines. She does make a rosé, an outstanding rosé, and she makes a sparkling wine. But we're gonna focus on the white wines today. I, um, their beautiful structure, very well balanced, and she is a fastidious winemaker, as you will note when we go through uh, and, and taste these, and, and um, you'll, you'll see what great balance they have, what great structure, the texture, the, the flavors that come up from your glass and uh, tickle your nose and your palate, you'll see all of that today. Uh, and um, so I'm, I, I look forward to, to tasting those wines with you. So David is a longtime friend from, we have known each other since the Valley New England days in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I um, met David uh, fittingly at a lunch table. I happened to sit next to him and uh, we've been cooking together ever since. And I think that was almost 25 years ago. So um, it's very exciting to have a, an old friend here and a relatively new friend that I look forward to uh, enjoying for a long time. All right, if you guys haven't poured your wines, um, please do. And we can start. We're gonna, the, the order of the wines will be the Ingenue, followed by the Claret Blanche, and then the uh, Roussan. But we, we will start with the, the Ingenue. David is gonna whip up some really uh, terrific things, and I hope that most of you are gonna whip those same things up in your, um, in your own kitchens. So um, what else do I need to say? Sue mentioned the, the chat function, so if you have a question, please put it forward, but I may not be able to answer it until the end of, um, so the end of the session. I think that is about it. And I will turn you over to, to David at this point. And he is getting, he's jumping at the bit to get going in his cooking. All right, David. Hey, everybody. Um, first, I really think it's important that you know that when Susan and I met because of Ballet New England, I was not a dancer. <laughs> I think that's very important for people to know, especially if you see the middle of my body. Um, I was uh, the executive director of the company. Um, also, uh, because I need to stand away from my iPad, if you're having trouble hearing me and you can raise your volume, that would help a lot. Um, I have to stand kind of far away from the microphone, um, working on getting a microphone for my lapel, but don't have it yet. So I'm going to start first with... Um, you know, cocoa and lavender is a passion of mine, and it would never have happened without someone who's actually on this uh, webinar today, and that's Doreen. Uh, Doreen was the brains behind it. She wanted to do it, and she got me interested. And um, 
I can thank slash blame her because I love it. <laughs> All right. So um, in the mise en place, which, as I said, is French for getting everything in place, getting everything ready, um, we, I asked you to do some toast. Uh, and the reason is um, that we want to cut our circles out of the toast. And if you don't have a cookie cutter that's the right size, really using a knife and making them square is perfectly fine. Why I pre-toasted them instead of cutting them and then toasting them is because with most sandwich breads, which is what I'm using, um, if you use a cookie cutter, it will actually crimp the sides and make them pillow-like rather than uh, quarter-inch thick or however thick your bread is. So by toasting it first, we can get a nice piece of uh, uh, toast for our base. Um, my preferred bread for this, which was um, not something that is, is easily found in many places, unless, of course, you're lucky enough to be Pamela in France, is pain de mie. Pain de mie is a bread, the word mie, L-I-E, means cr the crumb. Uh, it's it's the, uh, the insides of the bread. It's all about the insides, whereas most breads that you get in France, it's really important what the crust is like. On this, the crust is not so important. It's the inside. So you want something soft and cake-like. Um, if you used a really good quality um, a boule or something like that, and you, and you toasted it, it's going to be very hard to cut with any butter. So if anybody's done that, you'll need a little extra time to push through. So I'm going to start with those right now. And my toast, as you will see, is in all sorts of varying stages of dark. I did burn a couple of pieces this morning, um, not paying attention. And you want to cut out 24 pieces with your cookie cutter. Um, my bread is kind of small, so I ended up with eight slices. Um, however many you end up getting, it'll probably be fine. So start cutting out now and making sure you get as many slices as you can for each piece. Do not throw away leftover bread. Um, I would toast it yet even a little further, and then you can make um, uh, bread crumbs out of it. So you see they come out nice with a nice side like that, and you're going to put that on a, a baking sheet. I have my baking sheet with some parchment on it. Um, these do not make a lot of mess, so you could actually put them directly on the sheet if you wanted to. Um, and we're going to just cut some of these out. It's going to take a little while. So while we're cutting out, I think there's going to be some more chit chat between Susan and Sue. And you think just right. Uh -huh. I'm going to talk to Sue a little bit about how she came to be making white wine in Lodi. Mm -hmm. But before I ask her that question, Rodney, may we see the slide that shows us exactly where Lodi is? Because some people don't know where it is. And we'll, we'll get that up there and you'll be able, Sue can describe uh, uh, um, to some extent eventually um, how its location convinced her how the terroir there, meaning the climate, the soil, the, the, uh, the weather itself, the uh, altitude, all of those variables convinced her that white wine might work well. So can we, can we enlarge that? Can you see it, Susan? No, I can only see the small version. The small version. So if you could make it bigger, Rebbe, just click it bigger. <clears throat> yeah. Is that better? Um, no, that's still the no. small version. But I, I, David, can you see the? I can see yeah. the small. Can it go full screen? Okay, we're trying this. Here it comes. Here it comes. Okay. All right. There we go. Right. <laughs> so I just wanted everybody to know where this wonderful wine comes from. It is Lodi. It is not pronounced Lodi, as some people I've heard pronounce it. It is Lodi. And um, I grew up in Fresno, California, which I made sure I had on the map there. So I'm very familiar with Lodi. And that song about getting stuck in Lodi years ago, by Creedence Clearwater Revival. I mean, it was kind of true back then. But I tell you, I would get my eye teeth today to be stuck in Lodi, especially at, at Acquiesce uh, Winery. But it's at the top of the San Joaquin Valley. It's in the Central Valley of California. And um, so it, it is known for its red wines. And it is especially known for, at least in the past, although things are changing for its big, 
kind of jammy uh, Zinfandels. Nowadays, I hasten to add there are some outstanding Zinfandels coming from there that are anything but jammy. But it was back in 2006, if I recall correctly, that Sue, living in Lodi, decided that she would make white wine in the midst of all this red wine. So Sue, what led you to make white wine in Lodi, California? Well, I tell you, um, you know, we bought a property that had a vineyard and um, I, just a few years after that, I started making my own wine here on the, in the vineyard with Zinfandel, actually, and fell in love with a white Chateauneuf de Pop wine and thought it was the best white wine I had ever tried. And I had been a wine drinker my entire life. And uh, this was, I was about 50 when I tried this um, white Chateauneuf de Pop. And I went to the store, I bought a bottle of it, loved it, went back and said, please give me uh, two cases of this beautiful wine. They got on their computer and said, you're holding the last bottle in California, I'm sorry. And so um, that's when I said, well, what is this wine and why is it so hard to get? And I started researching it and um, finding some French varietals. And um, that's pretty much what drew my interest to the white wines. We went ahead and planted a half acre of Grenache Blanc here just to see how it did. And we were thrilled with it. And that led to us planting the other varietals. And you know, talking about Lodi, I wanted to share a little information since you have this map up here. Um, Lodi is, I believe, the largest wine region in the U.S. Uh, we have over 110,000 acres of wine grapes planted here. And really, uh, there is a huge proportion that is white wine. Uh, a lot of white grapes are planted, but a lot of the big wineries kind of buy them up, and you don't see a lot of them under the Lodi label. But what makes Lodi such a great wine-growing region, it's obviously in the Central Valley, um, of um, California, but it's high enough up in the, the map here where you get the breezes in the evening. So even though we could have 95, 100 degree days here in the summer, um, in the evening it's in the 60s because the Carquinas Strait, which runs through the delta, brings these delta breezes in the evening that cool the grapes down, cool us down, and so sometimes the summer evenings can get a little cool. So maybe, did you want to talk any more about this map or? Well, I, I, um, I know that some people can't imagine that you had the Chateauneuf de Pop wine and that you thought it could work in Lodi. So, I mean, you've sort of alluded to some of the reasons, but I think you must have had to have done a lot of research to see the similarities between Chateauneuf de Pop and Lodi. Yeah. That people so, are really unaware of. Yeah. The, actually, Lodi is a Mediterranean climate, as is the southern Rome region of France. So that was the biggest uh, thing that we checked to make sure that these grapes would do well here. The soils here are a sandy toque loam, so even though we don't have the big galettes like they do in the southern region of France, the, we have kind of a pulverized version because our soils are actually granite rock that has been uh, pulverized by way of the McCallamy River, and it's created this sandy toque loam soils, which I believe adds a lot of minerality to these wines. So knowing that and knowing that Lodi for years was a white, uh, focused on white wines, uh, but a lot of them fell out of favor with the big wineries. Zinfandel kind of popped in on the scene. And actually a lot more white Zinfandel was produced in Lodi than the red. So the big wineries bought Zinfandel for the purpose of making um, white Zin. So really that's a light rosé picked like the whites. And so we knew that all that was going on here. And that's part of the reason we decided to go that route. It was a big decision though. And if yes. I recall correctly, you had to pull some of the Zinfandel vines out, some um, 
uh, in order to put plant some of the wrong varieties and that was a big decision and we're sure glad that you made it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, it looks like David has probably finished his toast. I have. Are you ready to move on? I am. Um, I wanted to, if uh, people are still needing a bit more time, uh, could you say so in the chat so that we know to give you a little bit more time? We can't see you, so it'd be helpful to know. Um, and while you're maybe leaving a message, if you're not, if I don't see any messages soon, we'll continue. But um, some people ask me how I uh, decide um, how to pair a wine with food if I don't know the wine before I'm doing the food. And a lot of times there's a lot of really good information out there that you can find about wines. But one thing I do along the way, and um, not that I'm always having a glass of wine when I'm in the kitchen, but um, I do find it very interesting when I'm making parts of a meal. For example, what we're going to come to soon is making a butter, mustard, chai butter. And if I taste the wine with that combination and it's not good, I make a change. I, make, I change my mind. I do something a little different and then I test it. So I do some tasting along the way to make sure that what I'm doing is going to be consonant. So right next we're going to... Can you, can you just talk a little bit about, though, how you get your original ideas? Where do you go or? You know, um, I, I, you know, every time I think I've come up with an original idea, I'll, I'll, after I post it, I'll look on Epicurious or something. And believe it or not, somebody's already done it. And um, it's so it's it, I don't know if there is such a thing as a really original recipe unless you go really crazy with, you know, smokes and mists and whatever. But um, I, I tend to think of what foods go together really well um, and just kind of begin to pull things together. Um, one thing I've learned in Italian cooking is that no one recipe needs more than five ingredients. And when you start adding a lot of different flavors in, it can actually get confusing to your palate and to your parent. So the simpler sometimes you can make it, sometimes it's more exquisite and actually will be easier to pair with wine. Great. Then, it looks like there's a few people that are saying they're ready to go to the next step. Okay. So. All right, let's go. I'll save my question. All right, so we're heading on to the ham now, and we need an equal number of discs or squares of ham um, uh, to match the number of pieces of bread. So I'm doing it in two piles. I can get, um, I'm, I'm using a deli ham, but I can get four circles out of these discs and I have them stacked in four or in threes, and I'm just going to cut out my ham circles and set them aside for the moment. And David, while you're doing it, can you talk a little bit? You talked a little bit about blending food items together. What about pairing wines and food? Where well, do you get your well, idea? What I was saying is that you know, um, well, for example, with Sue's wines, and and anybody who wants to know more about Sue's wines. I have paired quite a few of those wines on cocoa and lavender with different dishes. And in fact, there's a dish on there from Sue, um, her pork chop scrutiné. Um, so uh, if you, but if you want to pair food with wine, you can always check. Sue is great. If you go on the Acquiefs website, every wine has all this information, including a really good listing of what pairs well, which is how we came to today's recipe. Um, she said that grilled cheese sandwiches, she said made with, with, um, uh, Gruyere pair really well with this, but we had decided to do goat cheese as an option for all these wines. And I thought, well, why not do sort of a play on the, the croque monsieur? So I got my ideas from the website. Not all vintners do this. Um, they should, but not all of them do. But you can go online and look up a wine. And a lot of times, um, a lot of the wine websites, uh, Vivino, they'll have suggestions for what this goes well with. And it may be as simple as, roasted meats or roasted fowl, but that at least gets you going in the right direction. I think uh, Mary is asking, I, I think maybe she's asking what you start with. Do you start with the wine and what am I going to pair that with? Or do you start with the food and what am I, what, which wine am I going to choose? I start with the chicken and the egg um, <laughs> because um, it, it's both. Um, so when I'm pairing a wine that, um, has been uh, been sort of uh, assigned to me. Like when I work for, with Susan and Townie, sometimes she will suggest a wine 
and I'll say, great, I'll get that wine, that'd be great to pair. And then I have to start putting together the meal based on the wine, um, which is what I did with these wines with Sue Tipton. Um, on the other times, I will have a meal that I really want a great pairing, and then I will actually just Google great pairing with X, and you get a lot of great information online. Um, use trusted sources. Uh, when the local uh, filling station gives you an, a, a pairing, don't take it. Uh, but, <laughs> but there are people out there who really do know this, and there are lots of wonderful books about food and wine pairing. Not all of which I agree with. I mean, not all of whom I agree with. Um, I am not a fan of Sauvignon Blanc, uh, as much as Susan tries to get me to be sometimes. Um, but everybody pairs scallops with Sauvignon Blanc. It's just a really traditional pairing. Well, not for me. Um, everything about it makes everything taste metallic. That's my palate. Your palate is different. Every, pal every palate is different. So I try to create things that work with my palate and hope that it works with my guest palate as well. Well, I, let me just add that Eric Asimov had a piece a couple of months ago about pairing wines and food. And he, he began by saying most of us, and probably a lot of you who are out there, panic when you think, okay, which wine am I going to put with this food? Or, or I have this wonderful bottle of wine that someone gave me, what can I make? And he, in trying to alleviate that panic, really emphasized the fun in this. And yeah. the, the, the really important part of experimenting, because it doesn't always work, mm -hmm. as David will tell you, and um, I'm sure Sue could tell you that too. I don't and know that, if now is the time or you need to proceed with the food, um, but have you have you ever had a flub? Uh, me? No, no yeah. of course I have. Um, <laughs> aside from burning the toast several times today, um, I tried to pair, I, I, I made an assumption. I had never had a French Viognier. I've only had American Viognier. And I tried to pair using my knowledge of American Viognier, a, a dish that is very heavy and dairy form, very creamy. It had uh, brandy in it. It was, it was um, lo uh, lobster thermidor. So it would have been perfect with an American Viognier, but with this French Viognier, it was a total fail. And I, and I mean, obviously we didn't stop drinking the wine and we didn't stop eating the lobster, <laughs> but, um, but I think uh, there were four of us at the table that night. I think we all, used our water glasses a lot more than we would of our wine glasses. Um, but that's one of the reasons I mentioned tasting the wine while you're cooking along the way, because you get a sense of the parts of your meal and what's going to work. And if something ends up, like if I had done the sauce and taste of the, of the um, Thermidor and tasted the wine with that, I would have immediately changed fruit for the wine. I would go with Bel Blanc. Oh, oh absolutely. Um, I'll just say in responding to something else that Mary wrote up there, uh, she's making reference to a Viognier that she really likes in uh, from Provence. And I happen to know, uh, Mary, that that was that Viognier. Oh. So that underscores how a really favorite wine just doesn't always go with everything. So uh, anyway, David, are you ready to move on? I'm ready to move on. So I would like everybody to get their softened butter out and to their softened butter, Add the Dijon mustard. I think we're going back to that slide. And by the way, uh, mm -hmm. Townie and Susan and Rodney and Sue have all made these dishes, this dish today, and so they know it actually worked, and neither of them have died, so that's good. <laughs> um, and then you add your chives into that as well. And, um, and you just mix that so you have a nice butter. It's a, a compound butter, a very simple one. And we're going to lightly butter our toast with that butter once it's mixed. Um, and that will be the base of our mini croque. So you can start buttering anytime. All right, so uh, every, while everyone's buttering their toasts, unless there are any questions, um, Sue, I would like to ask you, if, for those of you who haven't been to Acquiesce Winery in, in Lodi, you don't know that when you go there, Sue will provide food to go little little small plates to go with the the wines because for sue food and wine and the, the synergy that often happens when you combine the two is really important 
So Sue, can you shed some light on how you choose the foods to match your wines? Sure. Um, yes. So when we have our tasting room open, which it's not been due to COVID, but when our tasting room is open, we um, have usually about four or five different wines with little pairings. And um, we take each wine and my husband Rodney is pretty much key here to help with uh, this coming up with the pairings. So we try many different foods to pair with each wine. But what we're trying to do is uh, also to have something that's super easy to put out, something that doesn't require uh, a, a lot of refrigeration because uh, we're at the tasting bar and we're preparing it, something that is a wow factor for the wines. I think that there's really nothing better in the whole food scene than to have the perfect food and wine pairing. It makes the food taste better. It makes the wine taste better. And so a lot of it is trial and error. And people ask us all the time how we do it, but a lot of it is just trying different things you think might work well and trying the wine. And you might find that many different wines pair with one food, uh, which in our case happens a lot and it's hard for us to decide which one we're going to pick. But um, yeah, it's a matter of trial and error. And um, I think you'll be pleased. The white wines that we make here go with a wide variety of foods. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, um, we have a, a question here, David. Um, do you just add the mustard to the butter? Yes, you put the mustard in the butter with the chives and you mix it all together to make a, a basically a compound butter, a very simple compound butter. Okay, all right. Um, so, uh, how, David, do I have time to ask a couple of other questions? You can sure, I think we're going to All right. So, so, so many people think of cheeses and red wine, but I know a lot of uh, wine folks would say, really, white wine goes a lot better with most cheeses. Can you cast some light on that? Yes, I would say all cheeses except cheddar, we have found pair beautifully with our wines. And I think cheddar is probably a beer wine and that's probably why it's not that great of a pairing. But we, uh, when we first released our Clarette Blanche, we had paired it with um, triple creme from France, a Hornbacher from Switzerland, a uh, Seascape from California and a Tellagio from Italy. And we couldn't believe that this one wine paired so well with all the cheeses, but actually all our wines do. And it's interesting when we have, we've had a lot of winemaker dinners with chefs. And one thing they mention all the time is how versatile white wines are with so many different foods. And they love coming to our winery and preparing the menu because red wines, you big red wines, especially you're pretty much limited to red meats and um, it, they cannot handle a lot of the vegetables and fish and chicken and all the cheeses that our wines can handle. Mm. Interesting. I don't know if that answered your question. No, absolutely. <laughs> David, are you, are you ready? Um, yes, I am ready. Um, and um, the next thing we're gonna do is we are going to put the slices of ham on top of the mustard butter. All right. So I'll follow that question up to you, Sue, um, about pairing wines with, uh, with cheeses and, and any foods. Do you think that white wine gets the attention that and the respect that it should? You know, that's uh, you've kind of hit on a pet peeve of mine, Susan. Um, I. I always found that white wines were like a second class citizen, especially in the tasting room. I don't know how many wineries I've been to where I'm offered one token white wine and usually the winery that's presenting it never even made that wine. And then they talk about their beautiful reds and the higher price point wines. When I was in France last, I um, talked to a winemaker, I was noticing that his white wines were more expensive than his red wines on his menu. And I said, well, why is that? Because typically in the US, you think of 
the white wines being less expensive than the reds. And he said, well, you should know they're harder to make. And that's basically what I feel, that the white wines need a lot more attention during harvest fermentation, even far back into the vineyard. The amount of time that we spend getting the white wine, the grapes ready to be these white wines is an excessive amount of work, but um, I'm pretty happy with the results and that's why we do it. I think I remember reading someplace or maybe hearing in an interview, or maybe you told me directly, that you like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, when we first opened the tasting room in Lodi, we had a lot of well-meaning people say to us, you're never going to make it because you have all white wines in your lineup. And I said flippantly, well, if I don't sell them, I'll drink them. <laughs> um, and I meant it. But um, I was thinking, though, you would never hear that if the reverse was true. If you walked into a winery that was all red wines, you would never say you're never going to make it because you only have red wines and not white wines. So, And you see the same bias, though, when it comes to Wine Enthusiast magazine and all the other magazines. You rarely see an exceptional white wine with high points. And um, Jancis Robinson actually was just on a webinar not too long ago talking about that same subject, that, she oh, wow. that white wines, especially in California, are very much underrated. So um, I, I think my customers kind of speak volumes because there obviously is a demand for these wines. Absolutely, um, and the varieties that you use. David, I think we're ready. I'm going to interrupt for a moment. Um, I would help you drink those wines, Sue, just so oh. you didn't have to do it by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have a long list of friends that will help you. This is a good time for everybody to preheat their broilers to high if you have a different temperature, but you want it at high. You want the, um, the shelf to be about four to four and a half inches away from the elements. So we want to get our broilers heated. Maybe look at the question. All right. And so, David, are you going to, may I ask another question? If it's a quick one, because we're getting on to the next part, but go ahead. Okay, looks like Penny has a question, raising her hand. Ah. But I'm not Ooh. seeing what the question is. Uh, no, 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 she's oh. just raising her hand. Oh. All right. Um, so, I think she's um, going to help drink my white wine. That's what she's Yes, saying. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. she's, oh, she's yeah. going oh, to help. Okay. All right, Penny. I, I got you down for that. Um, all right. So maybe this is a good time for for me to point out that this is the glass that I'm drinking out of for the white wine. Uh, I am not. I am not drinking out of this glass, which I fill with very nice big red wines. Sue, do you want to talk a little bit about that? But why are we normally drinking out of a glass like this? Or I can say a few words. If yeah, you're drinking a glass like this, it'll be okay. But there, there are certain reasons why you might want to use a smaller glass with a smaller rim. Yeah, you know, that's to trap the aromas is what you want to do when you're, you're tasting the wines. But a big glass will work. But I would suggest staying away from a small glass. Yeah. Because you just really cannot swirl properly. Not this glass. And I think David's looking at me because he's wanting to move on. Is that right, David? You Don't keep talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> just want to make sure. So, yeah, I mean, when you're enjoying your ingenue, I suggest you put your hand over the top of the glass, do a little swirl, and stick your nose way in there and smell. I mean, way in there, you guys. Yeah, it's way in there because you smell it from way up here, not down here. So kind of swirl it, smell. So much of tasting wine is smelling wine. Yes, because we have so many of our olfactory senses. I believe there's over a thousand different smells that you can pick up. But taste-wise, there's only, I think it's seven, maybe, um, seven. maybe seven. So you really do miss out if you're not able to swirl and smell your wine. If you're in a room full of winemakers, you rarely see them drinking. They're usually swirling and smelling because they can pick up so much from the wine that way, so much more from tasting. Obviously, tasting and drinking is most people's favorite part, but uh, winemakers are all about the aromas. 
Sue, that was one of the most important things I learned from you when we were talking before this, is to put your hand over and trap the, the fragrance yeah. in the, the aromas. Mm -hmm. And you really can get so much more out of it that way. And it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. If you have a red wine, you want to have a larger glass and let the let it oxygen, let the oxygen get in there. Mm -hmm. Also, this keeps the wine cooler than yeah. this wine. Yeah, right. you want to avoid touching the bowl. You want to use the stem because it warms it up. However, I get the question all the time: How cold should the wines be? Our wines taste really nice when they warm up too. So you don't have to serve them just because they're white wines, super cold. Uh, we suggest about 50 to 55 degrees, but it's very common for us to open a bottle that's been sitting on our counter and drinking it right then and there. So whatever works for you. All right. If it's a good wine, you don't need it really cold. Right, exactly. A really cold white wine, you keep very, uh, really inexpensive grocery store white wine you keep super cold, <laughs> but a well-made wine allowed to open up. And I think David's saying, okay, I'm ready now. All right, David. Okay. <laughs> so um, next thing we're going to do is I hope everybody has an egg white. I know one of our guests had to run out to the grocery store to get eggs um, because they had an egg salad extravaganza and forgot to save one. <laughs> so I got that panic call just a little while ago. Um, so we take our egg white, and I'm just going to put in a pinch of salt. You don't have to if you don't want to, but I always do when I do an egg white. And we're going to bring it to Stiff Peaks. Um, I'm sure you all know Stiff Peaks are when you pull the beaters out, and it comes up like a little Hershey's Kiss at the top and stays there. Soft Peaks are when it flops over, um, kind of like me on a Friday afternoon after work. <laughs> um, so we want to just do that very quickly. And then um, it's getting close to the time to put them into the oven, so we're almost there. Mm -hmm. the, um, well, you mentioned, or Susan, are we going to talk about the other recipes later or whenever? Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and, and mention the other recipes right now? That would oh, be good. good. No, okay. So um, the other two recipes that you're getting are uh, very different. One is a a uh, salad with a walnut oil lemon juice um, dressing with pistachios, a little bit of Dijon mustard, uh, slices of pear, and fried goat cheese. Um, and that was beautiful with the uh, claret blanche. And then the final one, I went a little further than chaver or fresh goat cheese. I made homemade uh, paneer, which is an Indian cheese. And it, it's very solid. And I do use goat cheese from the farmer's market, made paneer, cut it into cubes, scooped out a little bit, fried them on two sides, and then um, filled them with a palak mixture, which is a, a spinach mixture of uh, Indian spicing. It, it was an absolutely beautiful hors d'oeuvre. It does not use a lot of the palak, so that leaves you with a full meal for the rest of the week. <laughs> All right. My egg whites are giving me good little Hershey kisses. So if you can see under the light there, I'm in good shape. Oh, don't clean your beaters. Just so you know, we're not going to clean the beaters. We're just going to knock those egg whites off. So John beer. wants to know, are we whipping the eggs or just mixing them? We are, mi we are whipping the egg white until stiff peaks. Yes. Can you show a stiff peak to the camera? Do you want to, can we, that, that's what yeah. this should look like when you're done there. Ah, yeah, yeah, no. there you go. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm guessing that people need just a little bit more time on this. If How John... are we doing for time, everyone? <laughs> they're too busy working uh, in the kitchen, I think. <laughs> Maybe they're too busy drinking the wine. Maybe that could be. <laughs> I might have had some already. So, we're drinking the the ingenue. Should I should I move on, um, David? A little bit about the ingenue. Can uh, we find out if anybody needs a little bit more time with the egg, and and then otherwise we can finish up. Probably, I, time uh, wise, we're probably going to have we're great on time. Everybody's ready. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So let's. Um, what I want you to do next is take some goat cheese, and I I'm using about three ounces. Um, my goat uh, cheese, uh, the one who makes my goat cheese at the farmer's market, gives these in about three and a half. So I'm going to do most of this uh, piece of goat cheese into a bowl. And then I'm going to 
take the beaters and I'm going to beat that by itself. And um, it's gonna be kind of uh, lumpy. I'll show you what it looks like after you beat it for a little bit. It does not look smooth and creamy. It looks a little lumpy. If, depending on your chef, some good? chefs are very soft and you might have a smoother product. But because of that, I am then going to take a spoonful of my egg whites and I'm going to stir them in to loosen the cheese a little bit. It's gonna make it a little bit more of a paste. And then I'm going to beat in the Parmesan cheese as well. Yeah. Oh, this is gonna be yummy. It is. Spoiler alert, you've had it. <laughs> All right, now, after you've got those mixed in, you'll have a very thick um, mixture that looks, that will stick to your spoon. And what we're going to do is we're going to fold in as best we can without deflating them, the rest of the egg white, because that's going to puff it up a little bit and make it more like a mousse rather than a big chunk of cheese. Now, when um, I, um, if you we're going to be putting this into a uh, um, pastry bag, pastry bag. Those are the words I was looking for. Thank you. So <laughs> or we're going to be putting them into a pastry bag. It's still going to be very thick. It's not going to be a light, fluffy product. And if you don't have a pastry bag, one thing I always say is. Even though I love making food really beautiful, it doesn't matter if it's beautiful, if it tastes really good. So um, if you did squares, if you don't have a pastry bag, you could use a Ziploc bag and cut mm -hmm. off the corner and pipe it out. You could even dollop it on with a spoon. There's Tony's Ziploc bag. We do have pastry bags, but... <laughs> but he proved that you can do this. Um, and then yeah. one trick that I learned, and I don't remember where I learned it. Oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> One trick I learned is when you're using a pastry bag, um, I can't, I, I guess you can say, yeah. When you're using a pastry bag, you can invert it part way and put it into a glass. And that makes it a lot easier to fill. So when you are trying to get your stuff into the bottom, you're not getting it all over the sides and losing half of your ingredients. So I'm going to start putting mine into my bag. And someone asked me if the egg white was important in this. The egg white is important because it is what will make it puff up a little bit and stay puffed up when you when you put it under the broiler. Otherwise, it's going to end up just melting because it is, after all, cheese. It's all cheese. So the egg white's important. I tried it with egg yolk. I didn't like it as much with egg yolk. And so I thought just the egg white worked perfectly. David, I'm glad that you're doing all the experimenting for us. That's my job. <laughs> and, and just so everybody knows, I am not a, I, this is a Halloween costume that I bought. I don't work in a restaurant. <laughs> and we insisted that he wear it. <laughs> they did. I have family members who are going to be ridiculing me forever for this. Um. And they're here. All right. So with your, now, if you have, a, if you have a pastry bag, you, Get all your ingredients down to the bottom and you twist. And as you twist, you're actually pushing out. Yeah, my, my sister-in-law said, yes, they are going to be making <laughs> um, You push it out and there's the other one. And there's Mark's family too. So yeah, okay, great. Um, push it out. And then as we finish this, we're going to just pipe stars on top of each piece of ham. And they will just come right out there. But if they don't come out looking like stars, as ours didn't last time, <laughs> they will taste just as good. They guys. will taste just as good. It really doesn't matter. I just, I have the pastry bag. And by the way, this pastry bag, I don't know who made it, but it's silicone and it's wonderful because it cleans really easily, which most pastry bags don't. Um, and I don't like to use the, the um, disposable ones because it's not environmentally sound. So this is a really great pastry bag that I just fell in love with. All right. Well, you're doing making the starfish design there. I'm just going to um, have a little sidebar here for a minute. I don't like Sauvignon Blanc either. <laughs> but 
there are a few that I really like, and I have now kind of made it my mission to find those and to introduce David to those. And I did just bring him one, uh, well, before COVID, and it's made by Kita, another Rhone wine producer who I know through, um, I mean, Rhone Ranger, right? Well, Rhone wine style producer uh, in, um, in the Santa Barbara area. And, and they make an excellent Sauvignon Blanc. Oh, those look beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Just a quick beautiful. pause, and then you can go on about Sauvignon Blanc. Once they're done, put them under the broiler for three to four minutes, depending on your broiler. Just keep an eye on them because they will. You want them to get the ridges to get a little brown. That'll look very nice. All right. And while they're in there, unless there are, are questions, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the wine that we're going to pair this with, which is Ingenue. And Ingenue is actually a blend, or as the French would say, it's a cepage of uh, several different grapes. And I'm wondering, Sue, if you can tell us why you decided to blend. You only have two blends uh, in your uh, portfolio of wines. And why you decided to to choose Claret Blanche, uh, Grenache Blanc, Bourbon and uh, Picot for this delicious wine that we're about ready to pair with David's creations? Well, I was so thrilled that we were able to obtain Bourbon Blanc. Um, we are the first winery in the U.S. to plant it and to actually make a single varietal Bourbon Blanc. And then we had also just planted the Claret Blanche, also very, very rare varietal in the U.S. But typically the French will use these varietals in a blend. So my initial thought was I wanted to have a blend with Bourbon my new planted grape, my Claret Blanche, newly planted, and Picpol Blanc. So in doing about 20 different trials, I realized I needed to add... Um, Grenache Blanc to this blend in order to give it the mouthfeel that I was looking for. Grenache Blanc has a great mid palate, great mouthfeel, and so the wine ended up being, as far as the tasting through all these wines, we decided on one. And then um, I had a winemaker friend who's been my mentor come and try the same blends and blind. I didn't tell her which one was our favorite, and she picked out that one. So I thought, what well, maybe we're on to something. And last year we won several big awards for our Ingenue blend. Um, but we have a 35% uh, Claret Blanche, 35% Grenache Blanc, 20% Bourbon Blanc, and 10% Picpoul Blanc. And if you like, I was wondering, I might be able to give you some idea. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of a Psalm Foundation Masterclass with this wine recently. And um, Jay Fletcher, who's a master Psalm with the Psalm Foundation, reviewed this wine and came up with some um, take on it. And so I thought I'd give you some of his notes. Um, it's a, This whole masterclass is available on YouTube if anyone's interested. Just type in YouTube Lodi Masterclass. It's a two-part series and really a lot of information in it. But Jay Fletcher said he finds in this wine and see if you can come up with it. And I'd like to know also um, how you feel about it and what you're getting from this wine. But his uh, notes were minerality, number one, jumped out at him. He said peach, pear, yellow apple, a slight anise or fennel, uh, peach blossom, lemon blossom, apricot, lemon, lime, vanilla, and a big richness. So he loved the wine, and it was uh, great to hear somebody of his um, stature talk about this wine. Um, in answering some questions, Mary to wants to know, how did I decide on the name for the wine? Well, I'll have to credit my husband, Rodney, it kind of starts out with the name Acquiesce. So the name Acquiesce actually came from a Katie Lang song by the same name. It talks about surrendering yourself to either another person or a higher power. And 
at the time that we came up with this name, we didn't even live here. Uh, Rodney had just traveled 10 countries in 10 days, and um, we were sitting on a patio in Portland, Oregon, where we were living at the time, drinking a glass of wine, and he said, Sue, one day we're going to have a, a place and we're going to call it Acquiesce. And I said, oh, really, what's it going to be like? And he said, I don't know, but we're going to see the sunrise and the sunset. We're going to have lots of land, and we're going to really enjoy ourselves there. And so when we moved to our vineyard home, we called it Acquiesce from the Katie Lang song. Well, Katie Lang has an album called Ingenue. And since uh, this was our newest blend with our newest varietals, we thought the Ingenue was the, the perfect label. Excellent. So we're getting a little bit of feedback here. Heidi, who is in our area, uh, said that she gives care and that it's amazing. Seems to, to raise me up. Uh, Marshall and Zoe really like it. So I know that I really like it and the minerality definitely speaks to me uh, in tasting it. Yeah, and some of the things, fun things we've paired with this um, are crab cakes with an avocado salsa, um, scallops. Uh, I make a version of Spanish rice that has bacon in it, and it's really a lovely pairing. Rodney actually enjoyed it uh, with some Wagyu beef that we had the other night, and he thought that was an excellent pairing, and he's got a great palate. So these wines pair with so many different things. Um, I'd say, you know, so many times what we do is we go grocery shopping and we buy enough to make a meal and we never really think about the wine until later and we're looking through our cabinet and saying, what would pair with this? I say, challenge yourself, get a wine you really love and then pair a meal with it. So do the opposite of what we normally do and it makes a, a, a big difference. So Heidi said that the bottle and table are gorgeous. <laughs> By the way, about the bottles, the bottles are some of the most beautiful bottles. Even my brother and his wife, who are art people, they wrote about the bottles. They said, the wine, we don't know what the wine's like, but the bottles are beautiful. <laughs> and I never throw away an ingenue bottle or, or a, an acquiesce bottle. I always save them for water at the table. It, they're beautiful. Well, our bottles are custom made, actually. So, so let me show you a way to reuse the bottles is uh, this is our olive oil so you oh. can reuse our bottles by putting olive oil in here although we did have a club member who said she used um, her wine bottle for olive oil and they had a big party one night and people had been drinking a little too much and somebody poured the olive oil in their wine glass so oh my God. <laughs> keep it away oh. <laughs> and we uh, people who come to our house know that we fill the bottles with water and then we also have the small lights that you can put in. Yeah. That oh, makes for a really beautiful scene. They are really gorgeous bottles. Oh, All right. Tony, are you ready? Yeah. That's great. Wow. Three and a half minutes under the broiler. Explain wow. That. Beautiful. Well, let's try these beauties with our wine. I need to maybe pour a little bit more. <laughs> you know, well, we're. Um, Let's, let's wait for everybody else to maybe catch up and maybe we can just take a, a few minutes to, um, to, to just emphasize the fact that you are using variety, grape varieties from um, Chateau Neuf de Pot. With the exception of one, the um, Viognier, they're all from the Southern Rhone uh, area. Rodney, if you could just briefly put that slide up showing the, the grapes. That would be super. So that everybody can see the connection that uh, Sue's winery, because so many of the grapes that she grows are not grown widely at all in the United States. The, the Roussan, for example, I think that uh, I remember from something from Sue that there are only 300 acres in the United States. Yes. So. Um, Grenache Blanc, so can you see the screen? Everyone can see it? it needs to be a um, little bit bigger. Bigger, okay. He's working on it here. I'm gonna share it. 
Here, let's see. <laughs> okay. Is that a and little bit? Pink pool is in Chattanooga Park. Oh, oh, pink pool. Okay, all right. Okay, great. Um, okay, so you can see there, uh, the Shetland of the Pop, you know, the uh, fabulous area, but most known for their their white their red wines. Although I'm a huge white Shetland of the Pop uh, fan, I know David is, and obviously when Sue is, um, in Shetland of the Pop they can use 18 grape varieties according to the AOC guidelines there. But very few white varieties are grown. I think it's something like 7% of the vineyards uh, are comprised of white varieties and maybe 6%, 7% of the wines that are produced there are, are white. The main white grapes there, I just thought I would write them out for you so nobody asked me how to spell them, uh, are there. Uh, then there's some other white grapes that are sometimes used. We highlighted the grapes that Sue uses in blue. So she uses all the main white grapes, from, and they are from Chateauneuf de Pop. So right. I'll let you explain that. Um, mm -hmm. But this is uh, really amazing because so little of um, these, or so few of these grapes are are grown in um, in the United States. That this is these are really special wines. Yeah, so Grenache Blanc in particular, I believe there's 330 acres grown in the U.S. It's one of the most popular whites in uh, France, uh, but it's always, almost always, part of a blend. So it's very hard to try it all on its own. Um, the other grape varietal that we have is Roussan, and there's only about 300 acres grown in um, the U.S. of Roussan. Also, even though that grape's been grown for over a hundred years off and on in California. It's a difficult grape to grow, whether it's California or France. Um, and so unless you're a winemaker that loves the varietal and wants to make the wine, you're more, more likely not gonna grow it because you're not gonna get a very good yield from it. Um, then also on that list is our um, Claret Blanche, and Claret Blanche, I'd say there's probably less than five acres planted in the U.S. So that's oh, kind of wow. a good idea of how rare these varietals are in the U.S. Bourbon, wow. even less than that. I'd say maybe 10 acres, maybe. Wow. So very rare varietals. Um, Pic Pol Blanc has really gained a lot of fame in um, our region as well as in uh, Southern California. It's a great varietal. It's very easy to grow. It's very easy to make wine with. And um, a lot of Lodi uh, growers have picked up on Pic Pau Blanc also. We're the first ones that brought it here, but they loved it so much they started planting it. And then, of course, I'm telling them how easy it is to grow. And so that encourages them that much more. But we can use more of it. So, oh, somebody's already on to the Claret Blanche, it looks like. <laughs> All right, well, let's see how the ingenue pairs with the uh, the mini quotes. Let's do it. Maybe then, Sue, I'll let you confer there. And everybody else. What, what, Jalit, my, my brother John is saying delicious. Mm. Great. Here's Townies. Wow. David <laughs> nailed it. it. And I'm getting, um, I'm getting images from people who are, I can't. <laughs> That's All right. That's a wow. Wow. And then, nice. um, then uh, someone who didn't have the um, the cut cookie cutter did them square, and they look absolutely wonderful. Square. Beautiful. Wow. Nice photograph, Great. Barbara, with the wine glass and wine in the background. Mm. <laughs> wow. Nice. Good. Well. So, David, are you happy with the pairing? I love the pairing. Um, and, and I knew I was going to love it when I tasted the mustard butter with the wine, and I knew that was a really good pairing. Mm -hmm. um, I did recommend in the not to use a smoky ham because I think the smoke would take away from the wine. So you want yeah. a plain, single, simple ham like you would get in France. They would call them uh, call it a uh, jambon uh, cuit um, as opposed to jambon cru, which would be like a prosciutto. And it works beautifully to me. And what did you guys think? We loved it here. <laughs> we absolutely love it. 
I'm also getting pictures. John, my brother sent photos of, of before and after, and uh, that they look great and they're very tasty. And um, so, uh, and I think it's been a been a success. It's great, and you know, with the holidays coming up, this is such a nice, easy recipe to um, have as an appetizer, whether you're social distancing or not. Um, I think it's a, a, a great, mm. easy appetizer. This is good. Right. This and, is and John is suggesting that it goes, uh, it could go well with an oyster Rockefeller. I think that's yeah. the, the, um, the topping. Mm. That's a great idea. And Chris made it with rosemary ham from Italy and it was fabulous. Wow. And he said it's delicious. I think it's a hit. So it let's go on yeah. to in light of time. So, oh, so what am I interrupting? No, let's go to oh, Claret Blanche. Yeah. Let's Claret Blanche. All right. And this is, if I recall correctly, this is one of your most recent plantings. Yes. So we planted Claret Blanche in 2015. It's one of our newer wines. And we have been so thrilled with this varietal. Um, Normus is our sommelier that works with us. And this is her favorite wine. She's tasted wines from all over the world. And uh, this is the one she goes back to time and time again. Mm. This one is a great cheese wine. So try it with your mini crow because it's going to go really well with the goat cheese. Um, I, tell me what you get on the nose. Oh. You know, these wines have so much of a perfume to them, we call it. Great aromas. And um, almost like I get like a, almost a sweet almond or dried apricot on the nose. And um, it's interesting, Susan had set me up with a winemaker in Chateauneuf de Pop who owns a vineyard that has these varietals. And when I was talking to her about the single varietal Claret Blanche, uh, Bourbon, she was shocked because she had never tried them. She was raised on the property, she had been making wine her whole life. But they co-ferment these varietals, and so they don't try them single varietal. And I think that's a really big plus. Um, we were lucky to have several masters of wine come to try this wine in tank when we first uh, had it ready to uh, process uh, the very first year because they had never tried it single varietal. So they, their draw was to come and try what it tasted like. So I think it's a great wine. One of the hits we had it with recently was we have this great uh, new pizza place in Lodi that makes a Cacio de Pepe pizza. And um, the Cacio de Pepe, I think you might have had, you know, as a pasta. But this, the cheeses in that, it, it just sings with this wine. Uh, one of our favorites, too, is a zucchini tomato tart that we make. And um, it has some uh, feta cheese on it, and it's uh, really a big hit here. So, well, and I know that what David paired it with when he was writing his wine pairing for for Bonds Winesing was with a fish and fennel chowder, mm. and that was another fabulous pairing. The the acidity in the wine with the creaminess and the and the um, chowder was just phenomenal. And I, I know that was great. What's that? The combination of the body of the wine and the and the chowder was just perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I hope everybody is noticing by now really how well made these wines are. The there's structure, there's texture, there's mouthfeel, and sort of a seamless flow from the first waft of aromas mm -hmm. until the finish, and lovely, lovely finishes. So let's move on to the to the next one, the uh, Roussin. Yes, let's go ahead and get the Roussin. Let's, let's do that. And um, I, I might to... add here that I forgot yeah. to mention that I paired the, uh, I the uh, paneer bites with the Roussin. I forgot that part. Yes. What's that? I forgot to say that I paired the Palak paneer bites with the Roussin. Ah, OK. Well, I, I paired last, we had a, for those of you who are watching, we had a rehearsal last weekend. And after that, uh, we paired it with an Indian ghost. Now, um, 
uh, David and Diana, if you're uh, uh, Jeff and Diana, if you're watching, that is your recipe that you sent me, <coughs> and it is it is so phenomenal. And this white wine, this Rosanne, went so well uh, with that spicy Indian stew. Mm. Terrific. It worked out because you had asked us which one we recommended last week, and I'm, I didn't even check back with you to see if it worked out for you. I'm glad it did. Yeah. Oh my goodness, it was really, it was so good, and the the, the stew itself was really so good. So, what are people uh, discerning on the nose here and the palate? So, Anthony wants that zucchini tomato tart recipe. So we're going to have to publish it. We'll put it on our website in the next few days. We'll actually put it on our recipe section. Mm -hmm. Something I make all the time. It pairs really well with these wines, and it's super easy to make. It's with a uh, puff pastry from uh, the mm -hmm. grocery store. So this wine, I always get apricots and cream. That's my... Very creamy. Very creamy mouthfeel, too, I think. But, but still some acidity as well, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. What else? And um, oh, the Indian stew. Pear, Eileen. I get pear, definitely pear on it. You Some people get like yeah. 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 Apricot. Apricot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have almond written down here as well. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, just a really wonderful wine. This wine won a double gold in uh, 2020 International Women's Wine Competition, and that was after it had only been in the bottle for a couple months, which this wine just develops the older it is. So if you had a, have a Roussan that's a couple years old, I suggest you try, open it up. I think you'll really be pleased. It really does mellow out the flavors and makes them, um, I don't know, you get kind of the best of the old wine uh, characteristics with this this wine. Uh, some of our favorite um, pairings with this are. Um, well, maybe Rosan to answer some of your questions there. Oh, we were talking about Rosan. Yes. Yeah, we were talking about Rosan. Very aromatic and complex. Thank you, Penny. Yeah. So um, fennel apple salad is one of our favorites with this, along mm. with uh, a tarragon pesto potato salad, which is on our website. Um, it's really a fun alternative to um, the old fashioned American potato salads and really lovely with this. Plus, um, Rodney's made several times a porchetta and that mm. recipe is on the website mm. also. And that is an amazing pairing with this wine. Um, and uh, I, I think that you'll find that it would be a great holiday event to try to, to make this porchetta. Um, also a salmon finocchio, which a fennel sauce on it was a, a, a nice pairing with this. But my all time remembrance for a Roussan is with foie gras in France. Oh, yeah. So trying a Roussan with the foie gras was like the angels were singing and the sky <laughs> opened up. It was one of those experiences. And, you know, I have since looked and a lot of um, wine writers like to pair sauternes with uh, foie gras. Um, but I find that the sweetness of a sauterne can overtake that delicate liver. Yeah. You know? And so um, if you can um, get foie gras, I guess it's legal again in California. But we've paired it recently with foie gras potato chips. So you can find them from Torres. Um, and it makes for a really nice pairing. So. Excellent. Well, I think just in, in terms of, of time, we'll kind of wrap up here. Um, I'd like to, to say a couple of things before I turn it back over to, to Sue. I'd like to remind people that these are all estate-grown grapes. Mm -hmm. um, Sue and, and uh, Rodney grow these on their estate. Um, the, there is no oak, it's just stainless. And these wines are made in accordance with um, Lodi rules, which is emphasizes the sustainability of um, winemaking. So do you want to elaborate just a little bit on Lodi rules? Well, Lodi rules is a set of over 100 different um, rules that the vineyard manager has to follow. 
in order to be certified Lodi rules. And basically, it's five different categories. Um, pesticide use, uh, the way we treat our employees, the way we manage water, um, the... I can't even remember them all now, but if you know, don't, that's why I, turn it back to I know if you don't, um, <laughs> if you exceed the threshold in all of these different categories, you cannot call yourself sustainable. And you know what? It's been like years ago. A lot of the bigger vineyards they would just spray everything instead of looking at the plants and seeing if it even needs it. They just would spray. And what we're trying to do is say, hey, we're not going to do that. We're going to plant cover crops. We're going to get beneficial insects into the vineyard. And we're going to manage our water properly and prevent a lot of these problems. And so, you know, we live on this property. We drink water from the well. Our grandkids play out in the vineyards. We want to have a sustainable place that we live. So that's uh, sums it up in a few words, I say. <laughs> I think it's a, a really important signature. Uh, I also just, in, in closing, this has been about wine, certainly, and it's been about food, but it's been about food and wine. And that's really important for both Sue and for David, for, for me as well. But it makes me think of one of my favorite winemakers, uh, Patrick Leon, who uh, most recently, he, he died about a year ago, and he made the wines for Chateau de Squan, the, um, the very expensive rosé Garus, uh, and actually at the very beginning, the, um, the entry-level Whispering Angel. But he also made wines for uh, Opus One, Mouton Rothschild, uh, his own Chateau uh, de, de, de Trois-Croix, um, and, and actually quick, for a short time for a, a vineyard in Napa called Spring Mountain Vineyards. I'm not familiar with them, but um, anyway, he told us at a luncheon at a very exclusive restaurant in, in New York one time that he would never um, endorse a blend until he tasted it with food. It was so important that the food went with the wine and the wine went with the food and that, that they were compatible because that's really what it's all about mm -hmm. good wine exactly so with that, i will thank you for allowing me to be the mc i want to acknowledge rodney who did a great job behind the scenes technically i want to acknowledge mark who tasted all of david's things <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. Tony, who also was involved technically. And was involved. Uh, thank you, everyone. And Sue, I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, gee, I was, I'm was i so excited you were a part of this today, as, as you are, David. I wanted to quickly mention a wine club member who joined us um, by uh, Crowdcast today. And um, her name is Linda Viewer Alstub. And she kind of got all of us together because she is the one that gave me that pork chop gratiné recipe that oh, David that's a great nice. recipe. She's on it today. Linda, yeah. cheers. Linda, you brought us together. I really oh, appreciate great. that. Hmm? That's yeah. so good. We're going to have to have Linda on. Maybe Linda will come and cook with David on screen sometime. So, um, this you have just made my Christmas list. You just have made my whole holiday season by coming here and joining us. And if everybody is enjoying themselves, maybe we should do this again in a few months. What do you think? I think it'd be fun. Let us know. <laughs> Let us know what you think, and uh, maybe we'll be back and in a few months. But thank you all so much for making this happen for me. Yes, everybody Cheers. needs to take your bell blanc. Taste your bell blanc. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, that's right. <laughs> right. Here. And the rosé. <laughs> and the bourbon. <laughs> yes. All right. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, Cheers. Everybody. Bye, Thanks bye, for bye. Coming, everyone. Thank you for coming, right? <laughs>